Good evening. Um, we are, hopefully you can all hear. Yes, it's being recorded, Andreas. Uh, good evening to you. Uh, so good evening as people are coming in. Uh, we are due to get started in just two minutes. Um, I can't start any earlier than that. So um, just literally as the FOMC uh, announcement comes out here this evening. And so um, uh, I'll be back in just one minute. Okay, good evening again. So very good evening to you all. Um, hopefully you're hearing me okay. Um, it sounds like the, the sound is all working fine. So we've just got um, just under a minute or so before we can get officially started here this evening. If you do want to ask, um, ask any questions here this evening, hi Sergey. Um, then by all means, you can type them into the webinar chat box. There is also a Q&A box um, as well. So there's two uh, facilities to answer, ask questions or anything, but probably just the webinar chat box would be um, best. And so, um, yeah, probably best to go with that one. So we'll just be getting started in just a moment. And um, uh, what else is there to say? Um, just making sure I can see there's still people coming in. So I'm still waiting at the moment. Is this the webinar chat? <laughs> yes, it is. Yep. Um, so we are um, about to get started. You should be able to see the screen. It's called Beyond the Beaten Path, an Entry and an Exit Strategy. So you should be able to see that screen. Uh, good, you can see the screen and that's, yep, yeah, perfect, okay. Now, if, um, Yes, there you go. So you are seeing the screen. So that's good. So we are about to get started. I'm literally it's just there's so many people coming in. I'm just giving it another minute before we do, in fact, get started here. And um, and then we can um, uh, crack on with the uh, the session here. So just as I'm seeing people coming in, I'm just making sure that uh, they're all hearing me, which I'm no doubt they can. Can you? <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've just been asked, can we have your name? Yeah, it's Charlie Burton. This is me. I am presenting this strategy th tonight. Um, so as it says, Beyond the Beaten Path, an entry and an exit strategy by Charlie Burton. Yes. <laughs> okay. So uh, you just made me laugh then. <laughs> so um, yeah, there's no one else presenting. It is me. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, Jose. Yeah, right. Okay, I think on that note, um, uh, <laughs> Johan saying he's here, so we can start. Right. Thank you for that. Good. Okay. Um, well, let's get started. There's there's plenty of us here tonight. Um, uh, it was amazing the amount of en entrance we had. Seven hundred people register for tonight's uh, session. So a huge number of people um, signed registered for tonight. Right. Um, now, if you, uh, everyone at the moment, you're all sending, just so you know, um, I, I can see your messages, but no one else can. If you want others to see your comments, then just change the, there's a drop down box before you write a post, you should be able to change that drop down box to everyone. It will default to hosts and panelists. If you change it to everyone, then others can see your um can see your message as well 
So um, it's up to you, um, but it, it defaults to hosts and panelists. But if people are thinking, I can't see all these comments, it's because everybody at the moment is sending posts to hosts and panelists, which means a panelist, which means only I can see them. OK, without further ado, then let's get started. Welcome to the, oh, OK, it's blocked, is it? Right. Oh, OK, it won't let you. Right. It must be their settings. I'm using uh, Tickmill's uh, uh, Zoom software here tonight, so they must have that block. Fair enough. OK, let's get started. Welcome to the beaten path, an entry and an exit strategy. I shall endeavour to um, go through this evening's presentation as swiftly as I can for you. Um, I appreciate they say that the average person can only uh, take in about 20 minutes worth of information. So, well, I don't suppose I'll be able to do it that quickly, but we will try and get all wrapped up within the hour. OK. So uh, other than that, um, let's get um, into this presentation. So risk disclaimer, first of all, the material provided for is for information purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. The views, information or opinions expressed in the text along, belong solely to the author and not to the author's employer, organisation, committee or any other group or individual or company. High risk warning, CFDs are complex in instruments and come with a high risk of losing money rapidly due to leverage. 75 and 74% of retail investor accounts lose money when trading CFDs with Tickmill UK Limited and Tickmill Europe Limited respectively. You should consider whether you um, understand how CFDs work and whether you can afford to take risks um, of losing your money. There you go. I got the lit <laughs> got my way through the risk disclaimers um, quite quickly there. Right. OK, so the overview for tonight's presentation. Um, for, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name's Charlie Burton. I've been trading 26 years and I've been coaching traders for about 18 years. Um, I'm relatively well known here in the UK as a trader. Uh, I was featured on a BBC documentary called Traders Millions by the Minute um, several years ago where they were filming various traders all around the UK. And I was one of those um, successful traders or one of the few successful traders, should I say, who was on that program. Um, I've also featured in the likes of the Financial Times, the Telegraph, various trader magazines and attended many, many shows where I've live traded over the years. I'm a five times undefeated live trade off winner at the London Forex show as well. So I've got a reasonable pedigree behind me in that I've built up a bit of experience now over the years. Now, it doesn't matter how long you have been trading. When it comes to the markets, we're always learning, myself included, doesn't matter how long you've been tra uh, trading, we're always a student of the market, as we say. So um, um, it, the market is always going to be testing you in so many different ways, and that's all part and parcel of our continued learning when it comes to trading. Okay, so let's go into the uh, this particular presentation subject. The psychology behind the strategy, this is what we're going to be covering off um, over this next uh, 30 minutes or more. We're going to be talking about using uh, this particular entry and exit um, itself, um, using what I'm going to show you as an entry and an exit tool, the probabilities of its outcome, um, the bank tested results as well. And I've put that in an inverted commas there, I've put an exclamation mark there, because um, there's a great quote that says, you can back test up until today, but you're still going to get tomorrow. And I think that's really important. Back testing, some people think back testing is like the holy grail of trading. And I think that that quote is really important. It just adds a, a sense of reality to that. Back testing is a really useful exercise but um, it's not the holy grail. You can backtest something and then start forward trading it and it just doesn't work for you. What I'm showing you here today, I have been using for many years, probably around about the last 10 years in, in the format that I'm going to be showing you it today. I've been using it um, longer than 10 years before that. But always keep that at the back of your mind. You can backtest up until today, but you're still going to get tomorrow. Okay. We're going to talk about integration with your personal trading as well, or you are certainly 
going to have that option to be able to integrate this with your trading. This presentation isn't about saying to you, look, here's a strategy, just go off and trade it. What I like people to do is to take a piece of information and then see where they can integrate it with their own uh, with their own style of trading um, or use parts of it or it might give them an idea even that they they do something entirely different on the back of some of the ideas that we go through here this evening so I'm it's not about oh you just go off and just just do what I'm going to be showing you here this evening do tweak it do test it yourself because people will find all sorts of different uh, ways to use this information so the early story is that many years ago um, I was looking for a trading stop strategy so I would say this was during the um, <laughs> in the 2000s probably 2007 2008 for my intraday trading I, I wanted to um, on some trades, give them that that scope to run. And so I was looking for and testing and trialing different ways of trail, just having a trailing stop. So <clears throat> I use things like moving averages and a close below a given moving average, like a an eight period moving average and, um, and things like that. They weren't quite doing it. And so what I ended up coming up with was um, using a close below the average lowest price of the last five day or the last five bars. So that would be my exit if I was trying to run a trade. So a close below the average of the lowest price of the last five bars. So if you've got the low, lowest price of the last five bars, if I just bring a pen up here, so if we got five bars, um, it's going to take the average of those of the lows of each of those last five bars and it's going to plot that okay so it's giving me a bit it's giving me a bit of room so let's say that average therefore comes let's say here so it's going to give give me a bit of room to um, for my trade to still potentially still meander its way higher but if it does come down that bit further, then I'll just get trailing stopped out using that. OK, so that's what I um, came up with. And that's what we're going to be going into right now. And of course, the opposite of this is the case um, for short trades. So if um, I'm in a short, it's going to take the average of the last five highest price points. So there's the high of that bar, the high of that bar and so on and so forth. And it's going to plot an average of that, which may be, let's say, here. And if price meanders back up to there, then um, then that would end up trailing stopping me out. So that's just some of the, the history behind how this came along. And when it comes to strategies, I've, like, I'm sure some of you are highly experienced uh, traders, that I've never really sat down to... To, uh, and just thought, oh, I want to devise a strategy today. That's never been the way that our strategies come along. They've always just come from pure observation a lot of the time, just from screen time, being in front of the screens and noticing little nuances that go on on the chart. This one came about from me looking for a trailing stop strategy. And then as I was then using that over the years, I'm going to show it to you on some charts in a second. Then you start to notice other things. And that's how what I'm going to show you here tonight um, materialized. So this tells me and gives me a visual of the short term, a short term switch in price momentum. That's all it is, because we're looking at the, the lowest average price of the last five bars or the lowest um, or, or the highest average price of the last five bars. If it's a short, it's as simple as that. OK, so let's go and have a look at this on a chart. OK, so I've now got um, and for the purposes of this exercise here this evening. Whoa, um, there's a lot of questions coming through. Sorry. Um, OK, loads and loads of questions. Um, 
Sergey, you're just firing questions at me. This is a presentation. I'll come to your questions if I can later on, but they're completely nothing to do with this presentation. So, um, but I will try and answer your questions for you uh, this evening, nevertheless. So, um, I've put up for, throughout this to, um, this presentation. This is all going to be using, I think, uh, monthly charts here. I'm just thinking of the um, the slides that I've got that I'm showing here tonight. So we're looking at monthly timeframes. Um, that doesn't mean to say that you have to use it on monthlies. I'm just telling you that that is the time frame of the charts that I've um, that I'm using here for the examples. Um, I don't need that. It's just a MACD down the bottom. I don't actually need that for the purposes of tonight. Just so you know. So those, what's plotting? These, the average price of the last five bars, I'm using candlesticks here, um, that's what this is. So the lower uh, line is the average price of the, uh, the average lowest price of the last five bars. And the upper line is the average highest price of the last five bars. So if I was getting into a long position, let's say back here, so it doesn't matter this, even if this was a five minute chart, like back in the day when I was doing a lot more day trading, then if I'd got into the trade somewhere down here and it's starting to run for me, then I would be looking at this point here because this is where price is closed back because price is coming up here, is closed back below the average highest price, in fact, um, is what I would have used uh, traditionally here. Well, there's two that I would use. I can use that if I want more aggressive exit. So a close below the average highest price. If I want to wait and see if I can give the trade and trade the run the trade even longer, then I would look for a close below the low, the average lowest price, which doesn't actually happen until way over here so much higher up so it gives me that opportunity to run trades that little bit more that just comes down to personal choice and this is all i'm showing you at the moment is how or, or the way that i used to use these i don't use them like this anymore it's not how i trade anymore i just tend to trade with targets but that's how these were born and i think i've got um now if you want to plot these onto your chart then essentially they are two moving averages. So a five period moving average, okay? Uh, and the main thing with this is you're setting it to the low price. When you put a moving average on your chart normally, it will default to the close. So what you'd want to do is put one moving average on, a five period, change the, the source or um, from the close to the low, and then click on OK, and then depend on what your chart software is. And then you would then go and put another five period moving average on and change this to the high. And that is what would then give you these two lines on your chart. OK, I call them my bands. So um, you'll hear me using those words here this evening when I'm talking about bands. But that's what they essentially are. It's just two moving averages and they are giving me the average highest price of the last five bars and the average lowest price of the last five bars. So coming back to uh, this chart there, like I've already said, we've got two arrows here. If I was trading this on the long side, then um, historically, and I was looking for an exit technique, then that would be an exit. And then the other one would be over here when it closed below the lower band. OK, now, like I've said, by using these, as I was using them more and more, um, you start to notice other other things, other ways of using them. And that's a natural progression that goes on. Let's just turn that pen off. If anyone's writing any questions, by, by the way, um, I'm not really looking at questions whilst I'm going along. So you're just gonna have to bear with me because otherwise it'll um, I'll disrupt my own flow. <laughs> so um, by all means, put questions down. I'll have to come back to them or rewrite them once I do start going through the questions. Okay, so 
it was always a used as an exit technique and that's how i wanted to use it just as you know for as a trading exit technique but gradually i noticed like i've said other ways of using it um, such as for entries as well and tonight we're going to explore a simple probability exercise um, and this all started around about probably te just 10 years ago so probably around about 2013 off the top of my head was when i started to realize that there was other information that um, accompanies uh, these bands so and that information is this once price closes back inside those bands after a previous after previously closing outside of them there's a 60 percent likelihood that price will then rotate to the opposite band okay so once price closes back inside the bands after previously closing outside of them there's a 60 percent likelihood that um, price will then go to the opposite band so if i go back to that chart there so what am i talking about here so let's take this example down here so price here has closed below the lower band here the lower uh, average price of the last five bars so the uh, i could just call them the band the following uh, bar it's closed back within so if it closes back within the band then there's a 60 percent plus probability that price will work its way to the opposite band okay so this is a like i've said this is a monthly chart so if I have that information whereby there's a 60% probability once price has closed within the bands that it will then go to the opposite band, it won't go straight there, this is a monthly chart, but I can use that information if I'm then trading actually off of a daily chart and then I get on my, just through my other analysis, uh, buy signals coming in on the daily chart well I can then can use that in conjunction with this knowledge that there's a 60% probability that we're going to that price can come up to here at least to the upper band well that's useful information for me because I'm now going to be trading something off of a daily chart it's off the smaller time frame but knowing that price may have that uh, potential to run to that upper band on the monthly time frame so combining time frames is really quite useful and that's what i've been using over the years so over the last 10 years having that information now i tested all this years ago 10 years ago and because i'd noticed oh right well, quite often not always of course it's 60 percent of the time it's not a hundred percent of the time but quite often, 60% or so of the time, when price closes back inside the bands, like in this example here um, that we've talked about, that it will then work its way to the lower band. Okay. So 60% of the time. So I tested it, and that's what those were the odds that came out. So I've known this for years, and it's been quite a useful for me when I'm combining time frame analysis. And um, if I want to be long something and it just so happens that we've in like in this example down the bottom, down here, um, oh right, I want to be long anyway on the daily charts. Oh, and there's a good probability that price is going to have a run up to the upper band on the monthly here. Well, that might be quite a good run. It doesn't look like a lot here on this screenshot, but this is a monthly time frame. So can be quite useful. Likewise, when price closes inside the bands here can be quite useful information if it's going to come down to the lower band so what i then decided to do just uh, a few weeks ago is to uh, test this in my trading room so let's just bring this all the way back down so in my trading room, I have a live online trading room with a community of traders. And so um, and we're always doing all sorts in there. I'm, I trade in there. I'm, I should be in there tonight. I apologize. It's FOMC and 
um, we shouldn't have done this webinar on the <laughs> during the middle of FOMC here tonight, but never mind. And my my traders are in that trading room as we speak. Now, as an exercise, I said, well, let's go back over and, and retest this information. So I was sat in my trading room and we got hold of the charts and we worked our way back. So let me just go back first of all. So um, actually, no, what I'll do, I'll leave it there. And actually, uh, if I bring my charts up, where are they? There they are. Okay, so we had an exercise where I was just scrolling back the charts and manually doing this exercise. There's no substitute for manually doing this. I can always go on and once you've done a manual test is then start to automate it if you like doing that sort of thing. But there's nothing quite like manually go back, going back and looking at the charts. And so we were just logging all of the times historically when price has closed back inside the bands, having been outside of them. So this one was outside. Once it's closed back inside, okay, did it get to the opposite band? Yes, it did. Right, that gets a tick in the box. And so that's how we started doing this. Just literally just a, a box ticking exercise. So, um, and while I was sat there, this was what I was writing down. So we literally were just running through all these charts and literally logged for the, as a initial exercise, which ones worked, which ones didn't um, over, oh, this was on the monthly chart here, the, these figures up here. And 68% of the time um, when price closed back inside those bands, it actually went to the opposite band. And that was over 36 years worth of data. It went, data it went back to 1986. Then I decided, decided to do it on the weekly timeframes as well to see what it looked like on the weeklies. We only went, needed to go back to 2010 because we had a lot of data over that. And that gave us 61%. So I always like to go err on the side of caution and just say, okay, let's say that it was 60% there. So that gives us an initial um piece of information in relation to those charts to say right yes yeah, 60% of the time also price once it closes inside the bands it will go to the other the other band now that by itself is really useful information i've known this for the last 10 years but it was good to bring those figures up to date and just to do it as a as a box ticking exercise so i can use that on a high time frame like I'm showing here so far, I can show that on a monthly chart and then say, OK, if we get a close inside the bands on the monthly chart, and it might well be setting up on the euro dollar this very month. I'll show you um, in a short while on that. If we were to get a close inside the bands on the monthly time frame, there's, there's a 60 percent or so, just a bit over 60 percent likelihood that price will work its way to the opposite band. In fact, why don't I just show you right now? So you can see at the moment, um, the this is the uh, the monthly chart of the euro dollar right now. And it's just, we've still got until Monday until this closes, but it's right on the brink of closing um, inside the bands here. So um, if that's the case, then um, then it gives us, we know that there's a 60% or so likelihood we come down to the opposite band. Now, for those of you who are clever, are going to see, well, we've closed down here and it went higher. So it didn't actually come to the opposite band. That was That's happened twice this year, in fact. But like with all um, entities, this is 60% of the time not 100% of the time. In fact, it just did it back almost well, back to back instances where it didn't actually work. And that's just as important for me to show you instances that don't work because this is, I keep repeating myself, but it's important, a 60% probability, it's not 100%. So, but it may well be that the Euro uh, closes back inside the bands this given month of July. So we know that there's about still a 60% probability we come down to the lower band. So that's useful information. Oh, actually, let's go back to the chart. Actually, just let's go back to the chart. So if that was to happen, 
then I, what I would then be doing is I'd be coming down to my daily chart and then looking for short setups. If we start breaking down a bit on the euro dollar, then I know that we've got those statistics on the higher time frames. And then I would then be looking for short strategy or strategies that I use to get myself short on a smaller time frame, such as the daily chart here, but run the trade down to um, that lower band, which is on the monthly, which um, is going to be somewhere down here in the 107s. OK, so it gives me a target to work towards and uh, an overall guidance, a probability, prob a probability of um, where that market may go. We'll come back to the charts in a bit. Um, I've already shown how to set up the bands, Vincent. You'll have to re-watch the, um, uh, the, uh, the presentation if you want to learn that again, because I've already gone through that. Um, it can now be used in conjunction with your own directional anal uh, analysis techniques. So whatever your own analysis techniques are, if you just periodically put those bands on, even if you only put them on something like a monthly chart, um, then they may be quite useful for you to um, to say, right, okay, um, price is closed inside the bands. Um, there's a 60% or more probability of uh, price closing in. So you can use that in conjunction with your other analysis like I've just said, and then combine it with, you know, strategies you might be using, entry strategies on the daily charts. Okay. Knowing that there's a 60% probability of something happening does give you a given edge, but there's still some howevers here. <laughs> That's just one thing. So I'm, and this is how I use it because I'm a manual trader at heart. I don't like mechanical trading myself. So I wouldn't just say, oh, right, that's happened, and then just blindly trade that. That's mechanical trading. Although I am going to show you a mechanical way of trading it here this evening. But my preference, because I've been trading 20 odd years, and I like, um, I like to feel that I have a bit more input <laughs> in my trades, then I like taking that that data off of the the monthly, knowing that there's a 60% probability, and then going down to the daily charts. Uh, if I get a setup on the daily chart, then I can then combine it and then trade it. So uh, that's how I prefer to, how I personally do it. And it gives me a bit of an edge there. Now, in its current form, I've said here, you cannot trade this mechanically. OK, you cannot trade this mechanically in its current form. Let me give you an example. So um, uh, let's go to the chart again. Uh, let's go to, uh, oh, yeah, back to the monthly charts here. Just trying to just uh, finding an example here. So uh, let's say let's find. Uh, I want to find a really nice sort of simple example. So um, bear with me. Okay, right. Let's take this one down here off the lows. Okay. So at this point down here. Price previously was on the outside of the bands. So now once it's gone on the outside of the bands, we're looking for price to close back inside the bands. So price closed inside the bands here. And we can see that it did indeed get to the opposite band. But if I was to just buy at that point, I'd have to place a stop at the low and then exit when price got to the band there. You can see there's a problem with this. Risk to reward. The risk to reward is skewed. It's risking more. I can we can see that just visually here. We can see that it's risking if the stop loss is down at the low, and this is the entry, and this is the target. Then the the risk to reward is skewed. That's no good. So if you try to mecha mechanically trade it, 
as it in its current form like that, then that wouldn't be any good. I'm trading it when I'm combining it with my other trading off of the smaller time frames. And so therefore I can still get good risk rewards. So, but if you wanted to mechanically trade it, you can't just trade it every time that price just closes inside a band and then run it to the opposite band. That's just given us the information that that overall should happen. But um, the risk reward just wouldn't be good enough. Okay. So um, could we make it uh, better? Could we skew that risk to reward? So let me bring, uh, I think, uh, yeah, okay. So now I've got this screenshot here of an instance whereby price has closed inside the bands. We'll take this bar here. So we've closed inside the bands here. And rather than just buying it at the point when it closes inside the bands, only buying it if we get a retest of the lower band. Okay, so after price is closed inside the bands, only buying it if we get a retest of the lower band. That's if you're wanting to mechanically trade this. So I've said I've actually started going through the probabilities of this very thing. I'm going to show you that. So only buying if it if it uh, retests the lower band. If it's a long, if it's a short, then only buying it if it retests the upper band. Then you place your stop at the low and then have that target at the opposite band. And then the risk to reward is much, much better. You can just see it visually that this is your risk and this is your reward. Much, much better. Okay. Now, next, well, what if we didn't just target the upper band? What if we what if we targeted something else as well? So yes, we could target just that upper band, but what about the prior highs over here, these prior highs here? Could we target that? Could we use my original exit strategy for the bands? Oh, well, wait, well, if price starts trending, once price then closes back inside the bands here, using that as an exit and so on and so forth. So. That's what I've been doing with my traders. We've been testing a number of these scenarios uh, just to see whether um, which, well, which scenarios are most profitable, or which one, you know, just seeing if they're all profitable and which ones are most profitable or not, of course. So bear with me a second. Uh, we are at, I'm just checking the time here. Okay. So sorry, there's lots of going on tonight because of FOMC. I'm getting messages coming through. Uh, so I do apologize on that. It's um, not the best of <laughs> timings of doing tonight's webinar during the middle of FOMC. So those are some different instances where we could do that. So now what we did, went back to pen and paper and you looked at only taking retests of the lower or the upper bands. That still gave a 50% success rate, but now with a better risk to reward. So if we do use that information and enter a trade down here, if we do you take that information and enter a trade down here, then using well we tested the upper band prior highs up here the last uh, swing high which is up here a close inside the bands over here as well so that's what we tested and i think i've just put some lines on the chart there we go those are the levels and then um having taken those levels we came up with a spreadsheet so we did actually put it in a spreadsheet we can't just have everything in a <laughs> we can't just have everything in a um, just written down like that so we when i'm first just looking at something and we're going through an exercise fuck quick then i'm just doing a box ticking exercise saying did it work did it work did it work did it get to the opposite band when we started doing this exercise then of course uh, we're looking at various exits exits at the prior high or low exits at the opposite bands um an exit 
on a close back inside the bands or an, or an exit on a close below the lower band. So if the bands are going up like this, we've also, yes, we can have an exit when price closes back inside the bands, but also um, what about if um, another exit, which is a close below the lower band? So there was four options there. The last one of those four is the one that tries to hold on to the trade the most. Uh, the one where we just exit on a on a touch of the opposite band has the highest win rate out of them because it's got the lowest target, it's got the lowest distance to travel to get to its target, but actually that one was the least profitable. It was profitable though, um, and it's still nicely profitable, but that was the least profitable. This one was the most profitable, and then the other two were slightly lower than this one but more than than this one okay so and this was all tested on a monthly chart so if i bring back the charts all tested on a monthly chart okay so we've now got a load of data there to say one we know the the probabilities of just when price closes inside the bands, having been outside of them, that there's a 60% or more probability that it will get to the opposite band. We've also now come up with a strategy for this to say, well, only if it comes down to the lower band and retests it, will, we, will that then create a buy with a stop at the most recent low and targeting either the upper band or some hot further up levels. Now, let's actually put that into some form of context because if we are gonna have that, if we are gonna have that, um, then you imagine down here, you've gone into the trade here and each one of these bars, that I've tested this on a monthly chart, each one of these bars is a month long. So if you were looking to hold it on a and wait for a close back inside the bands here, then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight months. Well, if you held on to a euro dollar long position for eight months, then you would um, incur quite a lot of swap charges, overnight fees, if you were holding on to a euro dollar trade that long. And certainly if you wait, waited for it to close below the lower band, which in this instance wasn't much higher, um, then that's several months longer than that. So is it feasible, is it practical to be able to trade this on these higher time frames, such as the monthly charts? Is it fat practical? Well, it doesn't matter at the moment. This is just an exercise in testing it. So the next job to do, and what I would encourage anyone who's interested in this to do, would be to test it on weekly charts and perhaps on daily charts as well. I don't think it'd be worth it on intraday. Sorry, sorry for you intraday traders. I don't think this, I think the noise of intraday just would, you know, wouldn't work. So, but weekly charts and potentially daily charts. So that would be something to test it on. Now, because then you're not holding on to a trade for eight months, you know, <laughs> like in potentially in this instant. Now, one way to overcome that would be to say, well, you would only take trades when the swaps are favorable in your direction. So when it comes to the euro dollar, you would only take trades when the euro is uh, on, on a short setup. Because if you're short euro dollar, then you receive the overnight swaps with your broker. If you're long euro dollar, then you're paying those swaps and then they gradually add up. They're only small, but they add up if you're holding on to a trade for eight months. So that would be the way to do it. If you wanted to trade it just in the background on monthly charts, or even weekly charts, then you might say, well, um, you'll only take setups which are swap favorable to you, okay? And so that then overcomes that. Okay.
so what we've done at the moment is we've got all this information. I've taken this screenshot earlier on. It's not giving all the information there, but um, all of this um, is uh, nicely profitable there. I will leave it to you to go off and do your own testing on this for those of you who are interested. I think it's very, very important for people to do their own testing on something. If you just get um, fed every last detail of the of my own tests, then that's not actually going to do you any favors. There's nothing better than testing something yourself. And by all means, many of you will say, hmm, I might be able to do something with this information with other stuff that you currently use. And, that, and that's why when we set about doing this presentation um, about how it can be integrated with your own trading, like I've said, I like using those monthly charts I won't trade it as a mechanical approach like I have just shown you with those these this is a mechanical approach looking at these various uh, exit um, exits after a retest of the band but um, so I won't do that but um, it's an interesting exercise and some people who like trading mechanically will love that sort of thing but uh, the but it's still really useful for me when I'm trading off a daily chart. If I know, ah, oh, we've closed inside the bands on a monthly time frame, okay, and on the daily chart it starts looking quite bearish, then oh, okay, well I'll I'll trade the short side, okay. Oh yeah, and that reminds me, I said that I'd go and show you what was going on there potentially on the monthly. So we've still got until next Monday, but the euro, it's not got a lot to do. It's obviously been moving up a little bit just whilst I've been doing this presentation this evening. But if the euro was to close back inside its monthly bands um, at the end of next Monday, then that will be a confirmed close inside the bands. Um, and then it will give us a 60% likelihood not 100%, but 60% likelihood of a run down to that lower band down here. Well, you know, if the euro starts breaking down on the daily chart and I take a short trade on the euro on the daily, well, I can then use that in conjunction with the knowledge that, well, we do have a 60% probability of price working its way to that lower band. Okay. So in summary, Using those average and lowest, uh, the average uh, of the lowest and highest prices tells us a lot about that short term momentum switch. It's, that's all it is. It's just saying, well, price has now closed back up above the lowest average price of the last five bars, or it's just closed below the average highest price of the last five bars. It's just telling us that there's a bit of a momentum switch there in the short term. Once we get that close back inside the bands, we know there's a 60% plus probability of a run to the opposite band. That's how I personally use the information. But as I've said, it can be traded mechanically. The only way to do that is to then wait for retests of the bands as I've gone through in tonight's presentation and then look at a variety of targets. You can make up your own targets um, and it, it does look highly profitable, I must admit. And so, um, but I've just tested it so far on the monthly charts and people can obviously go and test it on other timeframes and other markets, whatever. So the suggested levels are all profitable, but, and there's a but there. And the but is like I've just said, I've done all that testing on monthly charts. And from a practical sense, do you want to sit in a trade for eight months if you're paying swap fees? No, you probably don't. So um, if you did want to trade it on the monthly time frame, you'll be better off only trading it in the direction of uh, when you're receiving the swaps. So using the euro dollar as an example, you receive swaps when you're short euro dollar and you pay swaps when you're long euro dollar. So I will leave it for you to test and adapt. Um, I think that that is the uh, the right way to uh, to deal with these sorts of things. It's not about, um, uh, like I said, just completely giving you every last bit of um, my testing, but test it yourself, 
utilize it see if you can adapt it to how you trade if you want to but like i said i've been using this information for years and it's literally only been in the last uh, month that for a bit of fun we started to test some of these hypotheses and then realized that actually yeah from a from a mechanical trading perspective um they do actually um work, look like they work quite well okay so that is the end of the officially of the presentation and of course there's going to be plenty of um um of questions here so i don't know where to start but i'll i will try <laughs> so uh let's go and have a look what have i got here i've got this the thing is there's questions with this is the weird thing with um uh with zoom is that you get questions um in a q a box but you've also got people uh, asking questions in the chat box as well so bear with me if i haven't answered your question i will get to it we are at 7 45 48 so i better try and hurry up will you be sending the recorded zoom yes it will be it is being recorded and it will get sent to you how do you calculate the expected value of your of your one trade setup if the profit targets are always moving due to the bands do you not get a rough estimation of ours you can put from back to sync yes absolutely um exactly carl um what i do is i go in when you when you do the back test um, I would always be conservative on my numbers. So I would always actually pick a, um, when looking at the bands, because you're right, they move. But when you're back testing, I would always take the level of the band from the prior month. And then that um, that um, sorts that out, no problem. And, that's, and so that's how you then log it and get your R numbers. Um, the R numbers are here oops um in here the r numbers for the columns are here so we've got some big r numbers some eights uh 16 r trade here a 14 r trade so some big r numbers within all of that uh what are the averages again one was a five yeah they're both five m five uh five period averages one is set to the highest price so rather than just traditionally with moving averages they're set to the close price. Um, this is for Maddy. Uh, they are set what you put two five period moving averages on exponentials, one set to the high, and then put that on your chart. And the other one is set to the lowest price, and then put that on your chart. That's what that is. Yep, the recording will be coming through. Um, uh, Joe, thanks for the presentation. What platform would you recommend for backtesting? My current broker IG only allows 12 months using five minute charts. Yeah, that's not much use. Um, but I'd like to backtest further, i.e. five years. Well, um, if you want and some independent charts, then independent of whatever broker you use, tonight we are doing this in conjunction with Tickmill. Um, but for an independent charts, and I've got a feeling with Tickmill, this is trading view charts here. And I've got a feeling that Tickmill give you free access to uh, trading view charts. Don't quote me 100% on this because I forget all the different things that various brokers might have. You'd need to check with Tickmill. But if you have an account with them, then I've got a feeling that they actually can give you uh, a trading view charts. But trading view is um, really cheap anyway. So I would recommend trading view charts anyway. They're really cheap. Um, I used to be paying um, 250 pounds a month for my previous charts. Uh, with TradingView, I pay about £250 per year, and I've got one of their more premium packages, so you can have a lower level package, so they are very good. Um, how can you contact me? Well, um, contact me via social media if you want. Don't DM me on any of my social media because I never DM, but or just come to my website and you can always contact me through our website at charliebertontrading.com. Uh, thank you for sharing for us. Thank you, Martin. That's That was for Thanos. 
thank you for the knowledge shared, please. How do I get in touch with you? Uh, that's another person um, asking that. Yeah, just go to the website. There's a contact form on my website, charliebertontrading.com, and you can always contact me on there or my YouTube channel. I'm I'm relatively active on YouTube. You can always post a co post a question or a comment against any of my my videos, and I'll always see those on my YouTube channel. Which again is Charlie Burton Trading. Um, how many trades should you back test? Furthermore, how many forward tests until trade live? Yeah, good point there, Carl. I think um, with something like this, it's a low frequency uh, uh, trading setup. So you're never going to have thousands because it's generally speaking, it's a lower frequency trade setup. But um, and so like I, I went with the monthlies, I went all the way back to 1986. <laughs> um, so it did go back quite a way. Um, with the weekly charts, I only went back, I needed to go back to 19, uh, 2010 and that gave enough. So um, yeah, it's it does depend on the strategy. This naturally is a lower frequency strategy anyway. So I'm never going to expect to to have thousands in a back test. But bear in mind with me, Carl, um, I've actually been using this myself for years, so I have higher level of confidence in it. But um, but for you, if you're going to do it on the monthlies, I would still recommend on the monthlies going back uh, 30 or 40 years if you have access to that data, which you do with TradingView. Um, and on a weekly chart, you know, correspondingly, probably about 10 years or so's worth of data. Uh, thanks, Lorena. Uh, which steak did you prefer, Wagyu or Angus? What? <laughs> I've missed that one. Uh, Fendi, sorry, I don't know what that's all about. Um, uh, uh, Carl, furthermore, would you tackle or would you would you tackle that some trades hit 17R and others hit 1R? Do you target the mean or or the medium of two? Um, no, but you can. Um, I've just, like I said, you can test any type of exits exits that you want. So you could, well, that's one thing that I didn't, I haven't tested as yet, is just literally going for a, um, a mechanical exit of just X number of R. So you could just do that as well or come up with any other exit strategy you like. I just picked four there just for the purposes of, of showing this testing. I'm never going to trade this mechanically myself because that's not how I trade. But um, but for the purpose of, ex purpose of the exercise, exercise and giving it to my traders, then um, because some of them do like to mechanically trade, then um, I gave them some ideas there. But yeah, you could pick any other um, exit and just use an R multiple as an exit if you wanted to. Uh, Mike, um, thank you for your presentation. Looking forward to testing and trying uh, to integrate this into your strategy. I'm relatively new and this was very informative. Thank you. Uh, that's much appreciated there, Mike. Um, Jose, thank you. Do you have a Telegram group? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I have my own app for my, me and my traders um, within my community, but um, I don't use Telegram no, for that. Uh, thanks for this. Uh, Johan, uh, I have a question though. How do you feel about using those trading setups for crypto, do you think is exactly the same or completely different? Johan, I really wouldn't know. You would need to test that. Yeah. I I predominantly trade the euro dollar <laughs> and have done for years. So you would need to go and test that. Uh, Barker, please, what are the what's the parameters of the two moving averages you're using? Oh, I think I've already answered that. If if you have missed the beginning, then you will get the um the recording if you have missed the, the beginning. So um, um, I do go, I've gone through that a couple of times now during this presentation. Um, nice speech. What's the name of the indicator in trading view? It's just the moving average. It's literally an exponential moving average. Now I'm telling you anyway, Barker, there you go. So it's an exponential moving average. One, uh, and you put two on, five period, exponential moving average. One of them you set to the high, and then the other one you set to the to the lowest price. So they will default to the closing price when you put a moving average on. But that's not what we're doing with these. So two five period of exponential moving averages, 
and just change it from the closing price. Um, and then you put one of them, set it to the high and then click on OK. And then you do the other one, set it to the lowest price and then click on OK. And that will give you, um, if I can go back, that will give you the bands that will look will appear on your chart like this. Um, I'm just reading a long question here. So um, I'll, I'll read it out. Your current system on GU and EU is to target 5R and move the stop to break even after 4R. Um, and on the EU, you, you're targeting 3R. Um, is it smarter to take profits as price moves in my direction, such as start taking profits at fixed levels? If so, how are you calculating the expected value of backtest if you are using a system taking partials? Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, well, you you add them together, then divide by two or divide by three. That's how you do that. Also, if you were taking partials, wouldn't this be considered as an average win to average loss system instead of a strict? Oh, God. Sorry, Carl. Your question is so much off the beaten track from what I'm doing here. I've really got to answer people's question in relation to this. Apologies on that. Um, but there's other people asking questions on the on the on this topic here tonight. Uh, you you were working and didn't view this. Uh, where can you you review this webinar, um, Antonio? You will get it emailed to you in the coming days. Tick Mill will will contact you with the the recording. Um, I'm just trying to catch up with the questions you see. How can I get this video? I see I'm asking. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll just answer that. Thank you for the presentation. There's been plenty of thank yous, and, and I do appreciate the thank yous. Um, it's much appreciated. Uh, does the retest need to close below the lower moving average? No, it doesn't. Thank you, Thanos. No, the retest only needs to touch it. So when I was testing it, uh, if we come back here, so if we take this example here, um, when I'm testing it, again, I'm always conservative on the testing. So I actually... I don't actually log it at the point that it actually hits the the, the lower moving average there. Um, I I actually add 15 to 20 pips on top actually. So I'm quite cruel in the testing um, in um, just because I think it's better to come up with worse figures. <laughs> so uh, then um, it's better to back test worse figures and then you might be surprised by the reality. Um, so no, it doesn't need to do anything. Uh, it doesn't need to just double check in your, your question there. Does it need to close below the low move? No, it just needs to touch it. That's all it needs to do. Uh, but thanks. That's a good question. Um, right. There are other questions in the Q&A box. So I'm going to try and work my, oh my word, try and work my way through the Q&A box. I'm going to start with the latest, the the, the most recent questions and then we'll take it from there. So Rob has asked the question, do you think this isn't worth using on a four hour, one hour or 15 minute chart? Uh, I don't think so, Rob. Uh, the problem with the the smaller timeframes is the amount of noise that's there. So it's this is more suited to the larger timeframes, um, probably the weekly and monthly. Um, I, I haven't tested it on on dailies as yet, but probably best suited to the uh the weekly and monthly um <clears throat> yeah is there anything else to add on that uh yeah but you no know, like i've said i've given suggestions on how you can actually go about trading that but by all means test it on the dailies as well but intraday i doubt it you, you could try it on a four hour chart but um I, i'm just gonna put it out there i suspect that it loses its edge on such small time frames uh, Blake, thank you very much. Uh, Alex, hi, Alex as well. Uh, a bit of an unrelated question. Oh, no. <laughs> Always wanted to ask it to a trustworthy, successful trader. How do you decide which market to analyze and trade? Do you just go through all of them or do you have preferences? This is a good question, actually. Do you rely on expected news 
uh, to decide or something else. Right. Wow. There's a lot. There's a lot in one. I'll give you a little bit there. Um, Alex, I'm I'm always a believer. I quite like trading um, just a few markets, really. So um, I'm not out there trading 30 different markets, but that's my preference. I would rather probably 80% of my trading is just on euro dollar alone. And then I will trade other markets, um, but I do spend a lot of time trading that way. But and I'll trade the S&P as well. And I'll trade gold occasionally and the nasdaq and but um um so that's how i trade but it's not how you have to trade so um so that's how i decide you know what i do is look at all the major currency pairs so if we're looking at currencies first and foremost in my analysis every day of the week I look at the, the major currency pairs. So the euro dollar, the pound dollar, the dollar yen, the Aussie dollar, the New Zealand dollar. I tend to not bother with the dollar Swiss. Um, and I look at the dollar CAD as well. And then I'll look at um, the S&P, the NASDAQ and the Dow. I'll look at gold and silver, oil. And then I'll also look at bond yields as well because bond yields are so important at the moment. They are all of those markets are interrelated. So that's more than enough. I'm not trying to trade all of those markets, but I'm watching them within my intermarket analysis to say, OK, if euro dollar is up, but the pound dollar and the Aussie dollar are down, then that gives me a little bit of a red, a red flag, you know, that type of thing. So th that would take me a whole presentation or a whole course just to go through into market analysis there, Alex. But in the main, um, I trade those few major currency pairs. And of those currency pairs, when I say I trade them, that's what I'm analyzing. And a lot of the time, I'm just trading the euro dollar. But now and again, I'll trade the, the dollar yen or the pound dollar as well. Or the Aussie <laughs> or the Kiwi. So I will trade those others, but 80% of the time, it's the euro. Um, Okay. Uh, Charles, if you're still there, you asked uh, what other pr uh, indicators do I use with the bands? Well, again, that's a personal choice. Again, it's, it's another presentation in itself. So I, I can't go in that tonight. Do you have bots running strategies? I do have bots, actually, Blake. Um, but you've got to bear in mind, Blake, that I'm an old school trader. Um, I enjoy manually trading. So I do have some bots, but they are only running on a very small amount of capital. The enjoyment of trading for me isn't just about making money. It's it's the challenge, the mental challenge of pitting myself against the markets and, and working out. It's like a game of chess. So and trying to work out your, you know, the next the the next moves that are going to take place. And so just having automation for me isn't enough. Um, trading for me is much deeper than just trying to make money from the markets. It's a game of chess. And the way for me to do that is to manually trade. OK, I know I haven't got round to all of the questions because I can see there's some questions, but they were from a lot earlier now so i'm gonna just leave the the earlier questions if you don't mind because i've already seen um exactly blake yes it's it's a it's an art a chess game exactly so um i've realized you know we are pushing on a little bit now so um with there will be a a, a, a another webinar coming up in about a month's time so at some point later in august we will do another webinar within this series. There's a three webinar series. So I'll be doing another one uh, later in August as well. So you will get to hear about that. Hopefully you will be on, um, uh, I guess, the mailing list of Tick Mill. So you will get to hear about it. And so, uh, yeah, thank you very much for spending a little bit of time with me tonight. Uh, sorry for being a little bit um, waylaid at times because the the F we have been doing this during FOMC 
and so um, I want to go and check out what's been going on over there as well and uh, hopefully I see some of you in the near future do check me out charlieburtontrading.com or just go to my YouTube channel which is charlieburtontrading and you can always follow that as well and um, hopefully I'll see some of you soon